Hi right, guys, firstly, hi everyone. It's really a pleasure to, to see you all here in Croatia. And as you can see, this is a common problem of short people. So I'll, I'll try to look over the, the laptop. So today I'm here to present this way of farming. I deliberately am not calling it by any etiquette, permaculture or organic or something like that, because it really is a mixture of everything. And we are trying to use everything that works. And some things don't always work. So it's, I would call it the farming of like, like, like jazz, you improvise, you know? So this is like improvisational farming. I came up with a new type of farming, Christian. It's, it's recorded. It's, it's, my, it's mine now. <laughs> so, I call it, because I truly believe it, farming your way into the future, guidelines for a superhero. Later you will see why. Uh, as you can see, I didn't spend a lot of time preparing my presentation <laughs> because I like to focus on what is being told, not the, the cosmetics. So, are you ready? Or in American way, are you ready? <laughs> okay. So, what I think farming is today, it is a weapon of mass construction for several reasons. And because my wife, who is a farmer at heart, is a pharmacist also, I called th these things side effects of proper farming. So you can see, it's about health, physical, mental and spiritual, the health of the environment, and basically, I'm saving the world. Let's, let's be honest, I'm saving the world. Now, uh, I am kidding, but I am actually not kidding. Because farming is so much deeper than just being on the land and eating from the land. It has its effects on economy, on politics, on philosophy, on the community, on the way people think or should think. So, when I look at you, this is what I see. Especially you who are growing something, anything, at this moment. For me, you are, the guys are, of course, the Wonder Woman. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. It is, you are superheroes. Everyone who is growing anything today in this world is let's say, opposing the establishment in some way, in some sorts. That is very dangerous to say, and I don't want to get Christian in any trouble. <laughs> but it really is. It really is. It, it, I think it was Catherine Hepburn who said, uh, growing a, a garden is having hope, is having faith in the future. And it really is. Even more so today. So, this is my mind farm. I, as a city kid, always thought this is how a farm should look like. And I still struggle with that idea. I still subconsciously probably want my farm to look like this. Although I am aware that it never, never will look like this. But this is the mind farm of most of the people and there are serious consequences when you have this picture in mind because this picture is, is as fake as it gets. This doesn't exist. This is the equivalent of looking at a supermodel at a cover of a magazine and thinking that is the way women look like. No. So this is my mind far. So, just to give you an introduction. What's wrong 
about this image and this mental image, aside from the fact that it is fake. Uh, the wrong thing is that it gives us so many wrong ideas about how food is grown, how people should live, and really gives us some unrealistic ideals. And if you try to reach that, you will probably die a very frustrated person. So, this is the mind farm. Now I will show you the real farm of today, and you will see the difference. So I have a little clip from a documentary called Food Incorporated, which explains how did we get to this place today, the place of mass production. So I muted it so we don't have to bother with sound. The mass production of food actually started in the 50s in the, in the United States, where when there was need for mass production of meat because of McDonald's, because of fast food. Because of that, that's when first uh, the world uh, has met fast food. And then we went from growing our own food to getting the companies to do the same thing in large quantities. So now you didn't have 200 families having two cows. Now you had one corporation having 2,000 cows. And the effects were immense all over the world. Because now you didn't have a butcher doing all the work on an animal. You had 10 underpaid immigrant butchers doing the one and the same thing all day, which led to people losing knowledge. Uh, this is the farm of today, like big, massive, unecological, unhealthy, unclean, <coughs> pollutes air, pollutes water, brings diseases. And when you get a disease to save your business, you have to invest in chemicals to save animals. Chemicals go into the meat, which eventually we eat. So, it brought us a fair amount of stupidity to the people, to the workers, because after a generation or two, they didn't know how to process the whole animal, because all of their lives they did just that, just the leg, and the other guy did the other leg. So, it brought us stupidity, it brought us disrespect to the nature, now we didn't care about the animal anymore. We just found ways to make it more efficient, faster, and more productive. And this is what you get. You get mistreatment of animals. And alongside with that, you get mistreatment of people, of labor, of workers, of people, of consumers, of buyers. But still to this day, on the picture of the product, you have the ideal image of the mind farm, which doesn't exist. So I'm just going to stop it here. And I'm going to ask you if you have seen, oh, this is, I'm going to hold on. So in 1950, The chicken needed 70 days to grow this big. And in 2008, 48 days to be three times as larger. And not only that, full of chemicals. And not only that, this chicken from 2008 probably never, never has seen the sun. And it is so big that it can't stand on its own legs. That is why when you buy a chicken from a supermarket, its legs are this big and its chest is like an Arnold Schwarzenegger proper size chest. So imagine yourselves guys walking on this and having your chest like really pumped up. Yeah, this is just to show how tragically it has become. 
One other example. Have you seen the jar cow? The jar cow. Yeah, the jar cow. No? That's a cow that has a hole in its side. Proper hole. It has, and it has been uh, closed up and opened up like a jar. You have a, a, you have a lid. Then you open up the lid on the side of the cow and you can reach into it, its stomach when you need to. And when you don't, you just close the cow up like a jar. <laughs> I didn't want to show it to you because it's a disturbing mental image. You, you, would, you would be having nightmares. But it's the reality of today. So I call it the jar cow. So these are the chest of the chicken back then and now. Okay. So I'm just going to close this up. Let's go on. So that's the real farm of today. And this is my farm. So I just put two or three images, some ducks. Just not to show you the ducks, just to show you how chaotic it is how far from the mine farm it is. Uh, on the side, on the right side, you, you see, and in the background, you see some chicken tractors, like little hens, little hen houses, which are being moved around through the meadow. And each of them contains up to 70, 70 little chickens. And you move them around every day so they can get fresh grass, sunlight, bugs and all the stuff a chicken shoot it and this is my favorite this is all of the types of the corn we are growing because people are used to seeing orange carrots yellow corn red tomatoes and in fact nature doesn't work that way you have like at least 20 different versions of everything you have brown uh, like brown or, or blue carrots. So this is the corn we are, we are now uh, trying to, to grow. Why? Because uh, we, we are mostly doing our own animal feed. And normal corn, normal hybrid corn has up to, I don't know, 11% of protein. This, uh, some of these types of corn on the picture, which are old, old types, old kinds, have up to 20. And some of them are even illegal. I'm, I'm confessing to the camera right now. <laughs> some of them you can't even get in Croatia. You can't import them because they are so successful, so powerful. If people knew and they wouldn't grow pioneer corn or something like that. So, when you go to live to a village, like in which I am living, and you have not so educated people around you as neighbors, and all, all that they have seen in five generations is yellow, typical corn, and now on your field, on the field next to theirs, they, they see a black corn growing so i'm probably they probably think i'm a witch or a wizard and probably they're gonna come and get me with <laughs> the mob is gonna get me someday but no that, that is actually the natural corn different sizes different colors and different aspects different kinds of nutrition values and not the things we are used to uh, again, we have our mental images, but that's our problem, not nature's problem. So, this is how we started. The famous book I was talking to you about the first day. The book my wife was reading and crying and I was thinking she was reading some romance novel. No, this is what she was reading. You Can Farm by Joel Sellett and it's really a, a, like a, a, the simplest way the simplest way to get you started. If you have never 
even seen a, a chicken in, in your life, f uh, except at the zoo maybe. We had, we had some customers, grown up people in their 30s, who have never seen a chicken in their life until they came to my farm. Uh, amazing. Uh, one of the biggest lessons this book has taught us is to never cling to our expectations. You only can have two types of relationship with the nature. You can be a slave to it or you can be a partner. If you choose to be a slave, you and your environment will both die sick and tired and frustrated. But if you choose to be a partner, you can't afford to have to push your expectations on the land. So what we have learned is to do our best and never expect too much. This is where nature keeps your ego in check. So, today I'm not trying to be the master of my field. I'm trying to gain as much as I can from it in a respectful way. Maybe there are some vegetarians and vegans among you. And I produce meat also, but with a different mindset. I'm sitting here today and I can, I can say with 100% certainty that my animals, to, till their last hour, <laughs> live a better life that many of the than many of the people I know. So I have respect for my animal. I am fully aware that as, as I'm feeding it, it is feeding me and it is feeding the families and the children of my customers. And that that's, is essentially the difference.